Hello everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. It's 5.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, October the 20th, 2021 years, and it's your guess. As you can see, I still haven't changed my desktop. I'm working on that. Actually, uh, let me mention this. I'm, I'm actually working on a Facebook group. It's going to be similar to probably a lot of various groups out there because there's like there's a lot of groups that they they do alternative history, but of course they they kind of have to put that label of Tartaria or Mud Flood on it. Or you know there's these groups you know it's uh, it's aimed specifically at at Bible study. But, I mean, they're completely locked into the establishment narrative. There are specialty groups on specialty histories and specialty geographies. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. I mean, there's groups out there for atheists and theists to waste all of their time arguing. So, anyways, yeah, I'm working on making a group where people can come and kind of share... A broad range of information. I'm sure eventually it'll attract a lot of, uh, you know, shills, agents, I don't care what you want to call them, the bad guys. But I will be putting out invitations. Uh, if you want to join it, yeah, you have to, um, you have to request to join and then, uh, me or the other moderator will have to approve it, you know. You got to do that. But anyways, I'm trying to come up with a completely different graphic uh, now. It's been a long time that I've had these same graphics. It, you know, sometimes after a while, things get stale. And so I just want to change it up a little bit. So once I get that change, and that will be sort of the banner, then I'll start doing the invites. I'll basically be putting a lot of the older posts that I've created together on there just as a, an existing wall, and we'll go from there. Will it last a long time? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. If it's successful, um, then my guess is no. But, you know, the thing is, I'm, I'm in a lot of... Uh, let's see, I've got a, an account at uh, Facebook still under my name. For some reason, that has not been really attacked, and, and it's to me it's inexplicable other than the fact that I only have just over 3,000 subs on YouTube that I haven't really been, you know, <clears throat> attacked. I, I've only had a few videos censored, like to this day I still can't upload uh, The Myth of German Villainy Part 8. If you want to hear Part 8, you have to go to my BitChute channel. Or, uh, I think the channel Media Giant put all of them together into one file. You can hear it there. Um, and then a couple other videos. And it was just that they censored it in the way of you couldn't comment on it. You know, and you'd get like a little warning saying, you know, this is bad. Okay. And um, that was it. I've only had a few posts on Facebook also censored. And it, it, I just have to guess it's because the, a lot of people that have been my Facebook friends for a really long time, so these are mostly people that maybe I met through one church or another, or like family, friends of, th you know, things like that, they don't often interact, uh, either because they think I'm completely wrong or they don't understand anything about the topics, and, of course, the topics oftentimes have to do with the J-O-O, -O, but not always. A lot of times it's just criticism of Christianity and, and churchianity. But not always. Anyway, so that's been up steady. And uh, I'm also on Gab and Twitter. And it's World Truth Videos has now a social media platform, which is, eh, it's all right. Eh. But the thing is... It, Facebook, just like YouTube, the platform is so well designed 
And, I, you know, I'm not sure that I believe that nobody else could design as good a platform. Same thing with, like, YouTube. There's all these different video sharing sites out there. And none of them come close to the sort of features that YouTube can offer. I mean, that's the reason why people like myself and others that I know, we still, I have a, a YouTube subscription. I pay 10 bucks a month so that I can put a video on my phone, shut the, the screen off, and, and be able to listen to it. And it's just the way of it. And there still are some decent channels on YouTube, but not a lot. Not a lot. For any of you who are familiar with Cynthia McRae, and she was, though we really disagreed on, on biblical topics, she was one of the best researchers out there. We also disagreed on how much of, of establishment history that she accepted in, in as her narrative but great channel great videos really great videos of course you can still find her YouTube channel if you go to it it will say no content and that's really the way of it with a lot of really good creators so anyways so this is let's consider Luke part <laughs> and um, the reason that there's so many parts don't blame me I didn't do this I didn't do this. I am the poor, hapless sucker that stumbled onto how radically different Luke is from all the Gospels. But again, we're just using Matthew as our control. And when I get to points in Luke that are also paralleled in Matthew, and I find both of them in variance with the law, you're going to hear it from me. Because I don't I'm not going to do this thing, this religious-minded thing, this superstitious thing that says, oh, I can't question that. If I do, I'll get struck by lightning. I think there's a, a huge difference between using our minds. To the best of our abilities, none of our minds are perfect. And I think, I think if more critics, just uh, blanket critics of the Bible would keep that in mind. I, I kind of think they would make a better case, or they would go further in, in their criticisms if they would keep that in mind. Um, because some of the Bible critics out there, they make very good arguments, but the overwhelming majority of them seem to think that their mind is just so sharp, and that they aren't capable of error. But again, so many of them are operating on assumptions, and assumptions are always assumptions are always those parts of an argument that often aren't recognized or paid attention to, and they're the weakness. And they're the weakness. And if assumptions are part of our arguments, and I've said this before, there are assumptions that are part of my arguments. There's almost no way around it, especially given the material that I, I usually work with. Assumptions are in there. But you have to recognize them. You have to recognize them. You have to deal with them. It's best to deal with them publicly. Because when somebody gets wind of, let's say, certain arguments you have that are uh, in opposition to theirs, or you know, somebody's a professional a sophist, professionally controlled opposition, you know, a professional disinformation agent, they're going to, they're going to see these things immediately. The people that do this stuff are far, far better educated than I am. They're far better educated than most of the people I know are at doing this kind of thing, at sophistry, at wordsmithing. This is why this is why I get really upset when the people out there that claim to be Bible teachers that they're 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 looking out for people's best interests or or that that that, that they are even if they're they're not concerned about that let's say that they would say 
Well, I'm not as concerned about people's best interests per se. What I'm concerned most about is, you know, staying to the truth or serving, whether they call him God or Yahweh, whatever. You're not, I, I, I can't see how you are of service to him if, if he is the truth. I believe that he has to be. It's just in his nature. He, he has to be true. Everything he says and deems has to be. It's... It's just intrinsic to the nature of a, a perfect and good being. You're not doing him any favors. You're not serving him. If you ignore inconsistencies, if you ignore contradictions, like what we see just between Luke and Matthew, not to mention the other Gospels. There are contradictions and inconsistencies throughout. If you ignore them and continue to teach these things and just sweep them under the rug, you are serving no one. You are not serving anyone who listens to you. You are not serving the God of truth. And you are not. The only person you could possibly be serving is yourself through either popularity because a lot of people want to hear the comfortable half-truths or sweet lies. We, we, you can think of any kind of pleasant euphemism to fill in those blanks with. And the, the reason that I'm talking more to those who would seek to teach, and I don't care if you're teaching thousands or if you're just teaching your children, because at a certain point, you know, we have a responsibility given our age and our status and what we know. Because we are going to teach other people things, whether it's just a one person in our day to day activity or many, many people as part of a profession you're getting paid to or whatever, it, whatever reason it is that you do this. Okay. So, I'm in chapter 18. I wish I wasn't. <clears throat> chapter 18 is just loaded with problems. To set the scene of chapter 18, a number of chapters ago, it said that he was journeying towards Jerusalem. And the last location we have him at, before we're told that he's journeying towards Jerusalem, is Nazareth, Galilee area. That's important. And some what we're going to see later on here is going to be important to the idea of where he was, and where he's journeying to, and where he ends up. Because geography is important. Consistent geography is important, and logical geography is important. That's why. So we, we want to keep that in mind. But we're going to start out with, uh, we're going to go through these subcategories real quick. And I'm just going to show you a few things that are just a little strange. So Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, is the subtitle, Parable of the persistent widow. Now, I'm not going to just read you my notes. In fact, I'm going to read the actual wording of this and just try to listen to it, not thinking you're hearing the infallible word of the Almighty, but just listen to it thinking you're hearing something and you're undecided, okay? Now, I know more people, or some people will be more familiar with the Old Testament and the precepts of the Old Testament and other portions of the New Testament than this. So, if it's the case that you're not as familiar with those other portions of Scripture, just listen to this in kind of a logical, rational way what you hear, okay? So Luke 18, 1 through 8 says, And he spake a parable unto them, 
that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? And that's all of that subsection. Concerning my notes. Now, keep in mind, first off, this is not all that dissimilar to what we ran into a couple of chapters ago, the parable of the unrighteous steward. And he's comparing the activity of these unrighteous people in making... I just said compare, so I'm going to be redundant. A comparison between what the righteous should do using the example of the unrighteous. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that because what you can do is you can actually, you can even use actions of unrighteous people to illustrate a certain common truth. And you can use the actions of someone unrighteous, evil, whatever, to contrast actually between what righteous people should do. So I'm not saying that that for some reason, if he were to use the example of someone unrighteous, that that would be an immediate whammy. I'm not saying that. Now, I do take some issue to him comparing Yahweh to an uncaring and unjust judge. The judge was uncaring, the just was unjudged. Uh, the judge was unjust. Uh, it said he didn't fear God, he didn't regard men whatsoever. He basically had contempt for everything and everybody who was not himself. He was completely selfish. The judge finally gives the woman what she wants because she pesters him. Okay, then Luke's Jesus says, Hear what the unjust judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Well, it, the answer is not necessarily. Um... In Jeremiah 7.16, for instance, Yahweh, speaking to Jeremiah, says, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. But what if Jeremiah had persisted like the widow? Would that be in line with, well, Luke's Jesus or or? you show Jesus' other teachings. Now, Matthew 6, 7, he says, But when you pray, use not vain repetition, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. Okay, so not only does this go against... And that, the, the Jeremiah 7.16 was just, just one time where Yahweh had told somebody not to pray for the people because he wouldn't hear it. He said, it's a waste of time. I won't hear it. Stop praying for them. And now we see in Matthew 6, 7, and 8 that Jesus is saying... Don't use vain repetition like the heathen do. They think if they keep saying something over and over that God's going to finally hear them. 
because they're so persistent. He says your father knows the things you need before you even ask for it. See, Luke's Jesus disagrees. Luke's Jesus says, bug God. And then he's using the comparison of an unrighteous judge. He says, look here, this unrighteous judge, who's not godly, doesn't care about men. He decides to give in just because this woman's so darn persistent. Now, don't you think of, you know, your good father is going to give in far before him because he's good? Well, no. Actually. And here's why. That judge at the beginning of Luke chapter 18, he did not give in based on principle. He did not give in based on truth. He did not give in based on righteousness or goodness. He gave in based on his own flesh and his own desire because he said, if I don't give this woman what she wants, she'll keep bugging me. Okay, Yahweh never has to give in based on his flesh, his desire. Somebody's bugging me. You're not going to exasperate him. You may make him angry. If you keep persisting in something that you know good and well is just a self, first off, selfish request. So it's a really bad comparison from Luke's Jesus. Really bad comparison in stark contradiction with Matthew. Furthermore, I don't think I wrote this in the notes. Well, let's see. Um, let him, I, I wrote, let him know you're going to bug him for what you want. As the parable doesn't even state, yeah, I did write this. It doesn't even state the widow's case, by the way. He says she's a widow. She comes to this unrighteous judge and she says, avenge me of my adversary. For what? What did your adversary do? Did your, is your adversary righteous? Did they effect some righteous act upon you? Just because you're a widow doesn't make you righteous. She says, avenge me of my adversary. Well, we don't know anything about your adversary because your adversary could be good and you could be evil or vice versa. And that's based on our own modern concepts of what good and evil is, which the Old Testament words, Ro and Thub, don't even seem to reflect. They're different. But anyways, we'll use the modern concepts. We'll use the concepts most churches do, the modern thought in general, because the church is pretty close to actually modern secular thought on, you know, kind of absolutes and good and evil. And that's why there's common ground when, you know, somebody who's a, a big name in churchianity might debate somebody who's big name in, in atheism or agnosticism, whatever. Because there's common ground. There's so much common ground. And you would think, well, because, you know, truth is universal. That's why there's common ground. Well, truth is universal, but that's not necessarily why these people have common ground. You see, if, if Kent Hovind, who believes that everybody came from two people, every race somehow miraculously spawned and kept their racial character. And there's a lot of races. There aren't just three. That's part of the deception. There are many races. There are also sub-races from those races, which might tend to come from the intermingling, but I don't even know if that's so or not. But there are a number of races. So it would be like Kent Hovind, who does believe that all of the different varied races of men, I guess that would include like you know, what skeletons of like Neanderthals, and you know, they all came from two people, right? Who had three sons, three wives, they all came from them. He could argue and debate with any sort of atheist out there because they would have the same sort of idea. The only difference is what they call it. 
either post flood you know universal um <laughs> whatever theory or out of africa they they they're using the same ground that's why they can debate they have the same beliefs so anyways um and I, uh, what else did I write? Even though it disagrees with Yahweh's proven character and Jesus' teachings, as I just showed there. What Luke's Jesus is saying, God will do it just to shut you up. Because apparently you can weary Luke's God. Even though throughout the Old Testament, like everybody knows some of these great passages, right? Where it says that he doesn't get weary, he doesn't get tired. But I guess you can... According to Luke's Jesus, you can wear him out. The line from Luke 18.8, 8, by the way, that was in that text I read from Luke, Luke 18.8, 8, where he says, Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes? Remember that? That was lifted from Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. In a completely, radically different context completely different context for anybody who's familiar with basically the context uh, the, that we're talking about is um, well it then of course now the word escapes me <laughs> sorry now it completely boop, out of my mind eschatology <laughs> eschatology I actually had to pause this and, and cue want it because I don't Google. Only Google is a last resort. Eschatology. It radically changes the eschatology of an idea. Eschatology or eschatologies are, are doctrines built on ideas that people are finding within the Bible. And if they consider Luke authentic Bible, and they consider the other Gospels authentic Bible, they're going to have radically different eschatologies. This is why there are so many denominations. If you think that it's crazy that there's so many denominations, I got some clues for you as to why they're in existence. This is one of them. This is one of the reasons that there's so many. But there's others. And we really need to deal with all of the reasons that there's so many different denominations and divisions. You see... I'm not against division when it comes to being a matter of truth and right. But I am absolutely against divisions that were specifically, deliberately sowed because they would cause that division, you see. So, I'll move on. Luke 18, 9 through 14. This is... Pretty well known, I think, by a lot of people. This is... I can't impress enough how much the account of Luke has affected people's thinking and perception of Jesus and the Gospels. Maybe, pro you know what, probably more than Matthew. The only Gospel I would say that has had more effect on, on the way people think and perceive Jesus as a person, then Luke is John. Because everybody loves them from John 3.16 in the first chapter of John. I mean, John is probably... And more CI use the Gospel of John to try to prove that today's Jews were the Jews of Jesus' day. Because you can only use the Gospel of John to prove that. Yes, you can only use the Gospel of John to prove that and to uh, also further prove the doctrine of the great Satan, and so on and so forth. Now, some of these same people will deny the doctrine of hell and they will use a completely different mode of logic in their thinking and the way they disprove the idea of hell, but then still support the idea of um, the great Satan, or the idea that Udeus, which is Judah, it's a transliteration of Judah, could ever be Jew. So in this very well-known, um, and this 
course can't be a parable, can it? Because he j he's just describing something. It's, it's, it, it doesn't have like there's, there isn't symbolism used, what, what we would normally see in parables. Just describing something here. And um, I can read it 18, 9 through 14. It would be helpful probably if I did. And he spake this parable. You're kidding. <laughs> Didn't I just say, what is Luke thinking? It doesn't follow the idea of a parable. Or we've got the idea of a parable all wrong, or the word, the underlying Greek word here is not the same. So that's something you can check. I didn't check that when I was making my notes because my notes were regarding other aspects of this. <laughs> irony of ironies. Oh my goodness. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. My goodness, the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do is despise anyone. Because it's not as though Yahweh despises anyone, which he does. Of course, I'm being facetious. And, I mean, Yahweh forbid that you should be righteous and hate evil, but anyways, let's we'll continue. So Luke 18.10, two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. All right. Well, look, first off, I'm not sure why they would go to the, why why would they why would they need to go to the temple to pray? I mean, that idea alone sounds very religious. There would be very different reasons why you would go to the temple. I'm not saying you wouldn't pray in the temple. And um, from everything that I've read concerning Beats Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, that, that just the word temple gives us a completely different idea of it. If you read the descriptions of the building of it, the Jew temple is very different the idea they give us about it is very different than the idea, the descriptions that we would read on it in First Kings and in Chronicles. Which Chronicles? Two Chronicles, maybe. But anyways, I'm not sure why they would have to go to the temple to pray, but let's just say they went to the temple and they were praying. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. This word is kind of interesting, the publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with him, with him, he prayed with himself. Prayed thus with himself, not within, prayed with himself. Okay. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. So maybe he was praying with the publican and not himself. I fast twice in a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exhausted. Exalted. <laughs> I'm getting exhausted by all this. Now, Okay, so let's consider the Pharisee, which is Pharisaeus in the Koine. Pharisaeus, I talked to you about Pharis and Paris, and how the closest match to Pharisee is Pharisee, which would be someone from the kingdom of Paris. And the publican, the Telonis. We'll talk a little bit about that because. The funny thing is now you could you can cross reference this publican or Tolonus, but I've looked at a little bit concerning Obery because there is a huge, huge, huge number of words 
that we'll find in Koine Greek being a very odd language. It's, it doesn't match up with Classical Greek. We'll find this huge amount of Obery words, or well, well, let's just say Koine words, that bear all of the markings of actually just being transliterated Obery words, and almost across the board, without exception, these same words that would appear to be transliterated transliterated obery words that they're not admitting are transliterated obery words have dubious origins. So that being said, let's look at the Pharisee. The Pharisee thanks, we'll say God, for being kept righteous. He's thanking him because he's been kept righteous. He's done well and he has not been unrighteous. Who does not want to be and live righteously? We're not talking here about him being a hypocrite. We're not talking about him saying, do this, but he does that. We're talking about him being righteous. And based on every other statement of you show Jesus, being righteous equates to keeping the law because, not simply because of the letter of the law, because the keeping of it is being done by those who believe everything Yahweh said and promised to our forefathers, through Moses. This is faith. Keeping the law, which you would be righteous if you kept the law, because the only reason that you would keep the law or try to keep the law is because of your faith. That's righteousness. It's not always according to the letter of the law that you keep it that accounts one as righteous in the Old Testament. It is their desire and their will and their trying to that oftentimes matters more. This is why we can see men who made mistakes that are recorded in the Bible. They made these mistakes, but they're still counted as righteous because they acted on faith. They believed what Yahweh said. They acted on that. That's important. However, keeping the law is good, and you're considered righteous. Now, so, we would get into this whole idea because we see it. We don't just see it in, in the Gospels. We see it in the New Testament. A, an idea of, well, we see it more with Paul, really, I think. The idea that, you know, the letter kills. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And I, I get it. I'm, I'm not criticizing that particular idea. So I guess the thought is, all right, can someone entirely, I guess this, this would be the theoretical thing, right? Can someone entirely keep the law and their heart not be in it? They're keeping the law, but their heart isn't in it. Is that what we're seeing is a criticism of the Pharisees. Now, if we're talking about somebody who knew the law inside and out, and because they feared, we'll just say God we'll, instead of Yahweh, okay? Because they feared God, they kept the letter of the law, but they were constantly looking for ways around it, ways around the letter of the law, then yeah, that would be an unrighteous person. It would. But the thing is, as far as what our responsibilities are, as articulated in the law, they wouldn't be a criminal. But you would definitely look 
you would want to pay attention to their actions, what they did. This is actually important. I think this is a very... This is a really important idea that we, we don't just see in the New Testament and the Gospels. We see this throughout the Old Testament. It isn't the letter of the law, per se, that makes someone righteous. The problem I have is what we see here, I think, is a strange blend of different aspects that we see as far as relationship goes. Our relationship to Yahweh concerning our obedience and our willingness to obey. Our will is really important. Because if we obey but we have no will to obey, that is just sort of like labor without much of a point. There's some validity to that. Um, but we see that this guy has gone to the temple to pray. A. Listen, if he was keeping the law just because, you know, for some religious reason he thought he was going to get struck by lightning if he didn't, it doesn't say he went to, to the temple to pray to be seen by everybody. I understand that there's other passages where it says that they love to be seen and recognized for their, you know, but that's not what we see here. We see that he goes to the temple to pray. They both go to the temple to pray. And literally all he's doing is, is thanking, well, I'll say God, for his righteousness. Now, there's a lot to be said about righteousness and living rightly. And there's a lot to be thankful for if you live rightly. And you've been kept right and righteous because it's a good life. Living rightly is a good life. I'm having problems right now seeing what's wrong with thanking Yahweh for keeping you from sin and living a righteous life. Just saying. Okay? Now, it ends where he says, and I'm glad I'm not like this publican. Talones. That's the Koine Greek word, talones, okay? Now, the publican. Possibly. Possibly from the Obery word, yelen. What's the koine? Talones. Yelen. Yelen is just a, a, an action of a root, lin. Lin or lun is, is, to, is to be um, unstable. Okay? Um, oftentimes it's used if someone is, is temporarily staying somewhere. Jacob temporarily stayed outside of Bethel. Um, the patriarchs temporarily stayed at at least one place on their journey to Mitzram, things like that. Lin Lun, it's just a root, and it's used for being temporary. It, you're not stable. And it's important to be stable. And we look at people who are stable with uh, pretty much a certain degree of confidence as opposed to someone who's not stable. Now, I'm not saying absolutely, without a doubt, that it is from Yulin, but I am telling you there's huge, huge, huge amount of words that appear in Koine Greek that don't appear to have any kind of provable Greek root. And when they're close enough to uh, Obery roots and Obery words, and in similar contexts, we do have to consider whether they might be. Now, the, the T appears on the front of a lot of verbs. Oftentimes, it will, it will sort of signal, it can either signal a future 
in certain contexts, and I haven't entirely figured out the T. But it does. Okay. So to see something that was Tolones, it's very reasonable to think that it might be Talon, and actually I found Talon. Uh, I found the, the word, the Obri word Yelin, as Talon, at least in a few occasions, and translated as basically staying somewhere temporarily. Okay? Said to be from G5056 uh, Telos, but here's the funny thing. So it's translated a number of times as publican, and we're told like a publican would be some sort of a turncoat, tax collector, so on and so forth, right? Public, publican. He's working for the enemy. The problem is that the telos that it's supposed to be taken from, if we believe that it is Koine Greek, which would actually make it, if, let's just say the word telos was taken from Obri, that would make it a different word, by the way. I'm not sure that it was, because in Obri there's different words for end. It doesn't appear to match, but the root ought to be the LOS part, which doesn't match the LON. ON and OS are different types of Greek, we'll say Koine, suffixes. So we would have to believe that the root would be tell. If it were, if the root of these two words was tell, then we have to understand why, in the one context, when we see telos, it's being translated as end, like the last bit of the matter, end. And why, in these other parts, it's a publican. Here's what I'm getting at. I submit for your submission that we don't really know what this offices, or maybe not office like in the official sense, but what manner of person this Talones in fact is. So maybe when he's thankful that he's not like that Talones, that's not so bad. Are you trying to tell me that there's something unrighteous about a man who looks at another, who behaves badly, who is a criminal, or who is any, you name it. And he's very glad that he didn't turn out like that. He's thankful he didn't turn out like that. You're telling me there's something wrong with that. All right. Now, the thing is about this Talones, who is translated as a publican, that's odd is, yes, he's very ashamed. It's good to be ashamed if you're wrong, but it's better to stop whatever it is that you're doing that you're ashamed of. Now, in this so-called parable, does he? Does he stop what he's doing, whatever it is that he's ashamed of? We don't know. We don't know. Okay, what we, our takeaway from that, uh, let me just read my notes first before I go on with the moment. But I say again, as in other portions of Luke, like the prodigal son or the servants not deserving their reward, which we just saw probably like what last time or the time before, we see that the one who does righteous works cannot be glad for that. They can't expect any rewards for his good works, his lawful works. He can't be happy about it. God forbid he'd be proud of it. As the law allows for, you can be pleased with the fact that you've been obedient, you've done well in the law. So let's abandon the law with its system of reward for obedience and go with a system of reward for feeling bad about disobedience. If you feel bad because you disobeyed, you're okay. But if you feel good about the fact that you've obeyed, or if you're thankful for being helped to be made into a righteous man, or being made into a good man, a righteous man who does right, 
You're a bad man. You're a bad man. See, it's very subtle to include this, it's not found elsewhere. This little statement at the end. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. <clears throat> okay. Maybe it would have helped in here to have actually gotten more information on these people. As opposed to pointing out that this guy, who we just know is the Pharisee, and every time we see Pharisee, we're supposed to think evil, evil. Though not every Pharisee is described as being horrible or evil or awful, okay? Um, it would have helped if we would have known more about him. All we get is he goes up to pray, and he's he's thankful that he's he's righteous. He's, he doesn't extort from people. That's something good to be thankful about, in my eyes, right? Or actually, as per according to the law, everything he's thankful for are lawful things. Man, it is it is good. It really is to live as lawfully as possible. It just it. You don't have anything on your conscience that's eating at you all the time. It's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying that's the end-all be-all of righteousness. But the problem is if we see a contrast in this man, this Talones, who may be a publican, who is ashamed and he's beating his breast because he's so ashamed, and Luke's Jesus tells us he's righteous because he's ashamed of being a bad man. Not that he's righteous because he set his face towards changing, or indeed did so. That is a problem. And it is quite similar to the comparison that we see of the faithful brother and the, come on, and the dumbass brother, and um, also what we had just seen with the servants. If the servants do everything, he told this it was supposed to be a parable also, like the chapter before. If the servants do everything that they're supposed to do, they shouldn't, they, they shouldn't expect any reward. What? Everything about the law. Everything about the law. And fine, I won't even get into anything that is ahead of that, afterlife kind of stuff, those sort of concepts. Well, look at just here and now. Do good, get reward. Do bad, get punishment. That's the way reality not a bad thing. Reward, punishment based on good or bad, that's a good thing. Because that encourages people to do good. And this is where I think oftentimes churches are so whacked in their, their perceptions of how to treat people. If somebody is continually, continually, continually doing bad things, they... If somebody goes to their job all week and they do a job that is just as evil as it can get. But they're able to polish it up. The world polishes it up so we don't see it as, as being as evil as it is. And there's a lot of jobs out there that we think are just common every day. Hey, you know, they're evil professions. And they're just absolutely welcomed into the churches. Well, you know, I mean, there are even people that admit that what they do is wrong, but they won't stop doing it. Because they make good money. But he feels bad about it. Don't you understand? He feels so bad about it. He is torn. 
But the money's good. So, you know, we have to bear with him. We have to bear with Brother Cohen. He's a good man. He just feels bad. He feels so bad about week in and week out hurting people, stealing from them, and defrauding. He feels terrible about it, but what else is he going to do? It's all messed up. Okay, so this is a little different. Luke 18, 18 through 30, parallels, not exactly, word for word, close. Matthew 19, 16 through 30. It is the, uh, in one account it says the young ruler, in another account it just says the young man. But both accounts would have you understand that he's wealthy. He's a man of substance. He has a lot. What I'm going to do, kind of like what I did where I talked about this whole idea of, um, you know, um, there was a portion in the Sermon on the Mount that seemed to go entirely against the law. We're going to at least look at it, okay? So even though this account is it's quite close, except for a little bit of wording, it is quite close to Matthew's account. We're going to look at both of them, essentially, the ideas that are being expressed in contrast to what we can find in the Law and the Prophets. The great bulk of what we call the Holy Bible is the Law and the Prophets. So we're always going to go there for our final reference, because without the Law and the Prophets, what else do you got? Other than a lot of speculation. So, there's a few issues. First issue, I looked into pretty well. And it's kind of depressing. It is certainly something that I am going to have to look into in great depth. And it's going to take some time. What I found when I looked into this issue is the eternal life, okay? So in, the, um, in both accounts, this guy comes to him and he says, what can I do to inherit in, I don't know, one passage says inherit, and another, I don't, he doesn't use the same word, but we've got eternal life. That's what we're looking at. Um, it's a form of eonos, eternal, in the koine, okay, and zoe is what's translated life. So if somebody, you know, somebody named Zoe, there you go. In addition, something else that's quite interesting, Zoe is what's used in the Septuagint for the name Eve. And there's a very weird thing about that, but I, I won't go into that. Anyways, here's the problem. It's a big problem. I don't want to depress anyone, but I don't want to be dishonest with you. I don't want to be someone who doesn't pay attention, okay? And who just wants to sweep things under the rug. I can't find eternal life. The words mostly translated as either eternal, so you would it basically comes down to alam as the word that's mostly, for the most part, translated as eternal. And I did test another word that's that's second mostly. 
with the word that overwhelmingly is translated as life, which is he or he with a <laughs> it's probably exactly where they in the East get the word ki or chi from, which is energy. Life. You run searches trying to find forms of those words together and you are going to come up very empty handed. In fact, I don't know of any points of law, anywhere in the law, that the idea of you living forever, whether you want to believe that the minute you expire you go to heaven, or God forbid hell, if you believe in that still, or whether you believe something far more biblical, that you go into the ground, you're dead. You don't think or anything else. You're not conscious. And that one day you'll be resurrected for judgment. Okay. The second is far, far more biblical because it can be far more biblically proven by biblical passages and text. No matter which you believe, you're going to have a hard time finding promises as far as keeping the law being eternal life in the Law and Prophets. Now, this could be, and I'll go in addition, there's some other oddities that I found while I was looking for this. And this is one reason why it took so long for me to just get this installment of anything out there. You're going to have also a very hard time finding references in the Law and Prophets to anything having to do with Adam and Eve, the creation of the Garden of Eden. You're also going to have a very difficult time trying to find any sure and conclusive promise of redemption in the Garden and Fall story. The implications of that, they're not concrete. Here's what my working theory is. Sure, one possibility is well, there's a few. But one possibility, let's say one possibility, that this is all nonsense. Right? That's one possibility that some have chosen to pursue. They believe that. Okay. Another possibility is there is no afterlife. None. We have here and now, and that's what we have. It's a possibility. Because you really can't find rewards for keeping the law, or this promise, specific concrete promise of redemption being this good eternal life, so on and so forth, in the garden account, the fall. A possibility is there is no afterlife, and the teachings that we see in the New Testament exclusively are pagan. They're not biblical. That's a possibility. It, it's a very real one. Anyone can make very, very strong arguments on that point. Another one is that right now, until we understand first off the form and nature of Obri in contrast to Hebrew, which means we can't keep teaching in Hebrew, 
We can't keep studying in Hebrew. We can't keep trusting anything about Hebrew. We have to understand the language as it was originally given. We have to sort that out. And then what we have to do is we have to run tests on words to find these, these common similarities to the roots, which there are. There are. I've done enough tests on enough words to tell you that there is a commonality to roots, like roots having to do with salvation. You can run searches on words, on roots, and you can find this similarity to words that have these similar glyphs to them, meaning having to do with the idea of being saved. Now, of course, in the Law and Prophets, that always has to do with here and now salvation. Same thing with death. And the Law and Prophets has to do with the here and now death, not some sort of eternal death. These concepts, both the eternal life and eternal death sort of concepts, we find in the New Testament. These are New Testament concepts that you have to forcefully apply to Old Testament rhetoric and text. You have to force them in. It's like the... the what, uh, the book that was written, Jesus on every page, the guy forces Jesus into so many situations that you, you couldn't just draw by reading it purely in and of itself and in context. I'm not saying you can't find him or prophecies about him. I'm saying a lot of people force so much in. So, until we understand the pure text, Obery, and until we understand this sort of abomination, which is called Koine Greek, and how the ideas which were most likely first written, not in Hebrew, but in Obery, and then put into this horrific language called Koine Greek, for the New Testament and also the Septuagint, how that was done, what they changed, and what concepts were missing. And I have illustrated not only in presentations, but in various episodes of the Obery Hours, how that's actually successfully done. Entire concepts are hidden or made up because of manipulation of the pure source original language. So, I believe that it is a strong, distinct possibility that these ideas that are missing in the text that we have, both our, uh, you know, denominational sectarian translations in English or other Western languages, and the Masoretic Hebrew copies, and the Septuagint, and the Latin, because the Septuagint and the Latin bear so many signs of literally being translations from a particular Masoretic text. We're not going to know for sure, and it's going to be continual battles, more denominations, more division. Those are the bad divisions. Those aren't the good divisions. There are good ones and bad ones. That needs to be done. That's going to be time-consuming. But I'll tell you something. It is so... It is so rudimentary to people's existence to think about that. Now, maybe a lot of people who have uh, really great lives and great health and everything else, they might not think about that much. But everybody thinks about it at least sometime. And the more you get sick or, or experience trauma and hardship, the more you're going to think about that. 
So it's really hard to believe that in all of that bulk of material that we have, comprising what we call the Old Testament, that there wasn't a whole lot more talk about that. What if? What's our redemption? What's the concretes of, of our redemption or possibilities of redemption? Things like that. Are you telling me we don't hardly see hide nor hair of it until the New Testament? A sliver of information in proportion to what we see in the Old. Are you furthermore telling me that so many people Israel being the nation that uh, that Yahweh elected to be his nation that he loved would know so little about all of that that they wouldn't consider those things seems hard to believe and i think most people understanding the the nature of simply the world around them even though we do witness injustice as we see it as we see it I was going to make a point the other day when I was talking to somebody I was going to make a point like how is it justice or how, how are we going to see it as justice when some very decent people among us or let, let's just say innocent children are slaughtered, butchered, brutalized. Yet the scum of the earth that don't even get their hands dirty to do it, just give orders to do it, the scum of the earth are living very comfortable, very lavish, pleasure-filled lives to very old ages. That is not justice, I thought. Yeah, that was that was my first thought. Well, we ha we have to see some kind of justice in 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 some sort of afterlife, some sort of judgment after this. That was my thought. I was going to make that point, but then I stopped and I considered the fact that first off, like I just mentioned, the words that are most used for evil and good in the Old Testament in Obri, ro and thub, ro for evil, thub for good, they're not consistently translated, A. B, they're not used in the same way that we think of good and evil. They're not absolutes. That's a tough one, but it's true. The last one is this. If a tidal wave sweeps through your city and does horrible evil, should the tidal wave be judged? It's an act of God, you say. All right. So, if a, a if a pack of um, wild animals come through your neighborhood and they kill and eat all of the children do they deserve judgment we'll say they come through and do this and then they run away and they live long happy lives where they keep doing that do they deserve judgment well they're animals <laughs> i see i see yes so because certain other beings, certain other animated things or individuals, look more like us than baboons, sometimes. Are you telling me that they actually fall under the same ethic parameters that the Israelites do? Because if we pay attention to the narrative of the Bible, not everyone falls under the same ethical imperatives, moral imperatives, <clears throat> as Israelites 
as Adamites, A, and even more so as Israelites, B. So it's a bad comparison. When we start looking at these people and we start saying, shouldn't this, if this, we might not be using purely biblical parameters for our judgment. It's just something you, it's something I keep in mind that you want, might want to keep in mind. Okay. Now I'm, I'm, I'm an hour 15 in. I want to try to get this done within 1.30. So let's just see. I'll move forward. But know that these are things that now that I've, I've seen the real serious problem, I'm just going to have to pursue them. I don't know what kind of time it's going to take. I don't know what kind of time it's going to take away from other things that I'm doing that are also important. But there's something that I have to pursue because they're really important. They're really important to everyone. They're important to every individual, I would think, out there. Right? I mean, don't we want to know? I want to know. I do. I personally want to know. What happens when I expire? What happens when my loved ones expire? I just want to know. Because there, if a good and just God entity person, or even force, if we want to do that, if we want to go all deist, created everything, then there is goodness, there is justice in this world. And it applies to every living thing, depending depending on whether those things are indeed acting as responsible agents or not. That's really tricky when we get to there too. But I'm sure that most of you hearing this consider that. What about when I expire? Is there justice? Now we say that, <laughs> we say that, and I'm sure everybody thinks when they think of it like that, everybody thinks they're going to heaven or something like that, right? Even the people that are horrible, horrible people, they think that. They do. They justify what they do. We all tend to justify way more than we ought to. And I think that that's, that's where we get to this, this point of grace, this idea of grace, because, I mean, really, I don't think there's any of us that really, really want justice, right? Come on. I don't know of too many people that really, really want to be judged <laughs> by a purely just rule. Um, I, I don't know that I, w I could pass that one. There are reasons. There are reasons why we respond to concepts in the New Testament that transcend just a response based on our own personal desires. There is a reason why I personally continue to respond positively to the person of uh, you show Jesus even seeing these problems that I'm seeing in the Gospels between them there's a reason that I continue re to respond in the way that I do concerning the person of Yahweh even though there are serious problems in the Old Testament these go beyond just personal desire because I'm going to say this, and this is a hard thing to say, because it's a hard thing to prove. I knew it because no matter, well, not because, in spite of, I'm just giving you the reasons why. I believe, and I think that it is, um, 
a very sincere thing. I'm willing to accept I have been through enough points of finding out things that were pretty horrific, but true. That I am at a point, and I believe I have been for some time, where I can accept just about anything, no matter how horrible, if it's the truth. There's that. But, in addition, a great many of us have built into us a gauge that alerts us to whether or not something is good or wholesome. It's the reason many of us look away when we see something ugly. It's the reason many of us are sick at things that are unjust in the world. So some of the reasons that I continue, even when I find things that are terribly difficult to cope with, and they sometimes are, they are very, can be very, very difficult to cope with. The fact that I'm not clearly seeing this idea of eternity in whatever way, form, in the books of the Old Testament, and I'm not, I haven't fallen to pieces because there's more to this than I, first off, can fully understand with my finite and fallible mind. That's a fact. The other is that even my finite and fallible mind is still good enough to understand the problems that there are in the language that we've accepted these things in. Not necessarily their original language, but languages that we've accepted them as presented to us in. That's why. I will have to take note of all of this, as difficult as it is, and persevere. Okay? Let me go to point two. Point two was, as this guy's asking, eternal life, right? Inheriting eternal life. That's debatable, words and all. Anyways, life, good. I want something good. Okay, so Jesus responds to him and says, well, you know the law. And he gives him like four or five points of law. Now that's interesting too because of what the law guarantees as opposed to what he's asking for. This is why it's so important. This is why I just spent all that time talking to you about the absence because of what the law does guarantee and what it doesn't guarantee. Now Jesus answered him with points of the law. And we have to consider what the law guarantees and then what the problems in the text are. But all right, all right, all right. I digress. No. Here's the problem. He answers him and he says, but I've done all of that since I was a kid. Oh, so then Jesus answers back and he says, well, all right then, if you would be perfect, and the issue at hand is eternal life, right? Eternal life. So it says that he answers back to him, he says, well, if you would be perfect, then sell all of your possessions, give them all to the poor, and follow me. My question is, is this something that the Law and the Prophets would agree with? Now, the Law and the Prophets wouldn't disagree like, you wouldn't necessarily be called a bad or an evil man if you sold everything that you had and, and done well with it and all. How, oh, except, however, however, <clears throat> as per the law, you were not allowed, first off, you weren't allowed to sell your land. Your land had to stay in your family. This is intrinsically important. This is a 
This is a point of the law that we have woefully forgotten. Your land stays in your family. It is so important that these daughters of one of the tribe, there, there were no patriarchs present in this particular line, sub-tribe of a tribe. They came to Moses to sort this out because they believed that their forefather deserved this certain portion of inheritance, but there were no men to take it because the men, the inheritance went under the men's name, but they got this certain amount of inheritance because there were no present men at the time to take it. The inheritance of land and a possessing of land, we know that the people in charge know this. It's why they are taking away so much land from the South Africans. It's why they, they draw up such sophisticated legalisms and deals today to where you can have a mortgage, you can have a mortgage on your house, and you can be so foolish as to believe you actually own it. You don't own it. You know. Owning land was vitally important in the law, and you couldn't give it away. It needed to stay in your family. It's very important. Now, more than that, what could be said about a man who, well, let's say that the land stayed, but he sold off everything and, you know, gave it to the poor, well, first off, his children, whom, who knows how many children the guy might have, they're not going to get any of those things, so they're actually going to be a little bit crippled in making their way now. That doesn't sound like a good thing to me, personally. Secondly, in all the words translated as poor, and I went through them, there are no passages requiring anyone rich to give everything to them. We're not allowed to oppress them. We're not allowed to mistreat them. And provisions are made in the law for them. But a man, but that a man, is righteous for selling everything and giving it to the poor. It's not to be found. Oftentimes, there are a number of reasons why somebody is poor. If we're just talking about money or possessions, oftentimes people are poor because they don't freaking work. They're lazy. Do you think it's a good thing if somebody's lazy and doesn't work? Like the, the evil world we live in today? where the, the lazy invaders who are here only to ruin us and our families, our future and our way of life, are just given, 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 would you see that as a positive thing? This idea, to me, stinks of communist ideology. Communist ideology doesn't work. It is simply... It is simply a, a rallying cry to people who are ignorant and pissed. Communism only works for the elite. This ideology. And what I'm seeing in this, I'm not entirely comfortable with. I'm just going to be honest about that. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm not trying to say I know all of the angles. I know uh, what it would be better ways of translating this, and so I don't completely understand it. I'm telling you in English as it's being presented to me, this idea is not harmonious with the Law and Prophets, and I am not supportive of it. And you can find it in both Luke and Matthew, same way. Now, what is salvation? What is salvation here in the kingdom of heaven? Because both things are mentioned here, okay? Salvation, I went over in episode 7 of the Obery Hours in depth. 
Salvation throughout the Old Testament as far as show and variations of the, the root show and show show, which is precisely what I believe that the so-called Koine Greek word sozo comes from. And I show you how that is in episode 7 of the Obrey Hours. It's always, always, always referring to preservation here and now. Noah and his family were saved from the flood. Lot was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah. David was saved from Saul. Samson was saved from the Philistines number of times. Saved, 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 saved. That's saved. Also words that we find having to do with death, destruction, even though there's way too many words in Masoretic Hebrew that are translated death, destruction, things like that. There are way too many. But they still again and again have to do with here and now. And that's part of one of the reasons why the language has to be tested. And it's a huge job. But what we don't find is the ideas of show having anything to do with hellfire. Hellfire. Judgment that anyone thinks Yahweh would affect on his children, those he created. When he judges Israel and Judah for doing the same thing to their children once, burning them in fires, to some false god or whatever it is through some ritual. We see that, at least in our English translations, we see that. But then in our same English translations, translations, we believe that he'll send his own children that he created to hell forever. That's not consistent. Now, the last one I have, this is, this is a minor point. Minor that the disciples would sit to judge the 12 tribes. Now, this is just in part of, of the interaction the disciples are having with Jesus, okay? Because one of the disciples says to him, we left everything. We left everything we had to follow you. What do we get? I guess one of them was Ray Romano. Not sure. Now, I am continuing risking being disrespectful, and it's not my intention. But I have to be very honest, whether I'm right or wrong. In all of Israel's history, by this time, one to one and a half millennia, yes, that's, <laughs> that's more than a thousand years, existence, and all the time of their existence, and this is not counting patriarchs before that, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, right? Noah, Methuselah, Enoch. It's not, not even counting them. Because they're not necessarily Jacob, Israel's children. So we're going to have to just go with Jacob, Israel's children forward. Okay. There have been absolute titans of righteousness, lawfulness, faithfulness. But these 12 guys that Jesus picks, it seemingly, well, seemingly, I'm going to say seemingly, seemingly randomly. Now, they may have been put there at that exact time because they were exactly the right people to do what he's saying they're going to do. I admit that. I'm not saying I have all the angles. I'm not saying I have perfect knowledge. I don't. But these 12 guys that we, we know almost nothing about before this and almost nothing about after this, unless you want to believe the traditions, just traditions that don't really have, that don't really have any kind of good, solid reinforcement, traditions from like Fox's Book of Martyrs, and the, even that is very, very, very sketchy. These 12 guys are to sit in judgment of the 12 tribes. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about what, like judgment forever? Judgment forever after the resurrection? Judgment 
at the resurrection, not judgment, at the resurrection. So we see judgment, but judgment how? You, are you telling me that nobody else is going to be qualified after this to judge the 12 tribes? Again, I'm not trying to, I really, really, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. You have no idea the amount of reverence and respect I have for the scriptures and the God thereof, but I have to ask honest questions. Okay, Yahweh can do anything he likes. He can put anyone in any position he wants, and he does, and that's that. These are just honest questions, honest observations. And then it says in Luke 18, 31 through 34, it says the disciples did not understand these things. This is concerning because it goes right into him talking about going to Jerusalem and, uh, and being betrayed and being crucified, being killed, and and rising again right after this. It says the disciples didn't understand these things. What's weird to me is he told them already, according to Luke's account. It's not a new thing he's telling them. He's told them. I'm not sure what part they aren't getting. This is Luke 18, 31 through 34. It's only a few verses. It says, Then he took the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted upon, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. This is the part that it's saying they don't understand. Now, in my notes I speculated, he's talked about this already. What part don't they understand? Now, I've heard a lot of people speculate. People saying, well, they expected him to take the kingdom back there and then, they, so they didn't understand why he would be dying. I've heard those things. But he seemed like he was being pretty clear what he said was going to happen. But it says they had no idea. Why, 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 do you know what he's talking about? Well, he says he's going to die. He says he's going to be abused very terribly and die. He just said it. He used plain language. What I thought was perhaps... I don't know if this is true or not, but there is an oddity about a lot of his dialogue. This is not just Lukean. This is throughout the Gospels. You'll see it all over in Matthew. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. Now, if we put that in Obri, it would be Ben Adam. Ben Adam doesn't mean that he was Adam's son, other than through, you know, all of the generations which are aptly traced through Matthew, not as much by Luke. Luke only goes back to Adam, but he adds a lot that who knows where he got those names from, like 20-something extra names, and he doesn't stick consistent with the names that he does name. However, I guess we could say, well, you know, I mean, he is you know, a descendant of Adam all of these generations later, maybe. Or it could be the fact that he is using a specific racial determination of a specific racial line or be better maybe to say kind than racial okay because we can see it for instance in Daniel's account in Daniel 7 when he says he saw somebody that looked as a Benny Adam a son of Adam what does he mean did he know what Adam looked like did he have a picture of Adam number of people are described as looking like a Ben Adam. Well, what does a Ben Adam look like? If not a racial determination, is that what confused them? I don't know. The last thing is this. Maybe two little points, and I maybe I should do this one thing. Okay, the last part is where in Luke, 
Luke's account says, As he came near to Jericho, there was a certain blind man, and he was begging. And he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth that came through. This is all according to the English. And he starts shouting to him, Son of David. He keeps calling him Son of David. One thing I thought that was really interesting is the fact that if you look at it in the Koine, the name that's being used in the Koine is David. D-A-B-I-D. David. This is interesting to me because of all of the, the oddities that you're going to find in, in any of the Koine translations, whether we're talking about the Septuagint or the New Testament. Here's why. There is, so there's no V letter sound in Greek, in Koine Greek. No V. And if you were to just be going from a pure Obery point of view, there actually are sufficient Greek letters. There is the delta, upsilon, iota, delta, if you wanted to go with the uh, duid from Chronicles. If you were going from, with the dud from Samuel, you just have delta, upsilon, delta. And the upsilon, depending, can be sounded out as U or Y. So why the radical change with the B in the middle? Literally the beta, David, okay? Well, um, he, the funny thing is this, and there isn't a consistency to it either, because if you look at something like Louis that has that a middle U, like dud, D-U-D, Louis is L-U-Y, they, they stick with that, upsilon, and they use it properly, but they don't use it properly here. What I would submit to you is that, for the most part, when they get to these names, we'll see it in a lot of other names, too. But not with the same, we're not talking about the same letters. This is a different case. That, for the most part, they're literally just following, again, a Masoretic text. Probably a singular Masoretic text, which doesn't agree with other Masoretic texts. And they're using those pronunciation rules because it's only the Masoretes that demand that when you use the, the name D-U-D, Dud, not the other times. Dud can be translated as uncle and beloved, things like that. Okay, it has other entries, but specifically the entry for the name that we come to know as David, that middle Vav, what the Jews call it, Vav, the, the middle U. They deem that it needs to be pronounced as a V there. Now, that's not according to the, uh, the, the, the Nikud, the Masoretic dot they put under it. That's just denoting the next vowel. They have arbitrarily deemed that when we say the name Dud or Duid, that we have to apply a V there. And V has a ubiquitous phonetic shift to B. Now, when I say ubiquitous, I don't mean always. I just mean frequently. It happens in Western dialects and changeovers in Western dialects. It's just something we see a lot. And it's just one of those little things that you should keep in mind. If you, for a second, thought that there was no connection between Koine Greek, a very inorganic form of Greek, in my opinion, inorganic form of Greek, and Masoretic Hebrew, very inorganic form of Obri. There's a connection there. There's a lot of connections there. Last thing, Luke tells us that he's on his way to Jerusalem. Okay, We see this a few chapters before that he was going from the area of Nazareth to Jerusalem. Luke's account says that as he came near to Jericho, there was a certain blind man. Matthew's so-called parallel account in Matthew 29, 29 and 30, not only says he was leaving Jericho, not coming to Jericho, leaving Jericho, but that there were two 
blind men crying out. Now, I know folks like Norman Geisler will use logic like this. He'll literally say, well, if one account says there were two demoniacs and the other one says one, well, look, where there's one, or no, I'm sorry, he would say, look, <laughs> where there are two, there is also one. Yeah, he literally says that. Now, I'm not going to say that here. Sorry. Literally in Matthew's account, that it, there is a plural. There's two of them. There's two of them crying out that he heals. Literally. In Luke's account, there's one. Singular, plural. Plural, singular. One is not two. One is not equal to three, four, seven, or 518. One is one. Two is two. Coming to Jericho is not leaving Jericho. And we know it wasn't that he was near Jericho and we're just misunderstanding because in Luke 19, 1, <laughs> it says that now he entered Jericho. So we know in Luke 18, 35 through 43, he was on his way to Jericho. And we know from Matthew's account, after he heals the two blind men, that he ends up in Jerusalem because he was indeed leaving Jericho. That is a major problem. That's a major con conflict. I was going to say confliction. <laughs> then I realized I don't think that's a word. That's a serious conflict. It does matter. It does matter. And actually, we'll see on the next one why it matters because there's things that he does in Jericho after Luke says that he healed this single blind man. The whole narrative is different. And if one of these authors of these gospel accounts can't get certain chronological points right, do you really trust him on anything else? Even the fact that the chronologies are wrong and often the spatial relationships are in direct conflict. That should be enough to tell us that someone is not to be trusted. So, that covers episode 12, that covers chapter 18, and that was a long episode. So I'll see you next time.